All right, we ready to roll? Yep. All right. Well, welcome. And, um, and it's very nice to be here. It's very nice to think that when I go home, I think I'm going to start planting seeds. And that's always a lovely time of year. Um, so this is a perfectly appropriate time of year to start thinking about container gardening and um, what it is you can grow successfully in containers, which is a lot. Um, you all have, I hope, handouts, two, two different handouts. Um, one is on growing in containers and probably the single most important piece of information in here, in here is, well, there's several important pieces of information. But probably the single most important one from my perspective, because I have a lot of serious feelings about keeping plants happy, um, is that you need to provide, if you're growing in a container, you need to always provide enough root wood for the plant or plants that you are growing in that container. So if you're growing fruits, vegetables, edibles in containers, learn about your plant first. Really, you know, try and learn about, okay, what's the root system like? When you buy a plant, by the way, yeah, I have a lot to say, so I'm just going to be ricocheting around. And as I'm ricocheting around, um, I really do encourage questions because questions and even Lisa, will there be questions from the uh, Zoom folks? Um, I, I'll we, monitor we the chat, it, but we'll do those at we, the end. We can do it at the end. Yeah. All right. Um, but if you have a question in your mind, there's a very good chance that either the speaker, that would be me, has missed something, or that other people in the room have the same question and don't quite have the courage to ask. So if you have a question, ask it, but be totally aware that you're talking to a deaf old lady. <laughs> so seriously, I will come and come closer to you or ask you to stand up and really shout. Shouting, I really love. I appreciate it very much. Um, but I really would like to be able to answer any and all questions that you might have. Keep in mind that when you purchase any plant, it doesn't matter what it is, you are not buying this. This is not what you're buying. You're buying this. You're buying a root ball. You're buying a root. This is the motor of all plants. All plants, think, if you want to think in terms of, of cars, um, this is the motor of your plant. This is what makes the plant go. This is what you're purchasing. So number one, when you go to a store to purchase any kind of plant, um, feel free to knock it out of its pot because you want to examine that root ball. And if the root ball looks nice and healthy, um, then, and the top looks reasonably healthy, then you can purchase it. If the root ball doesn't look healthy, if it looks diseased or deteriorated in any way or seriously, seriously overgrown, um, you might want to consider another plant and not the one that you, but do not hesitate to knock plants out of pots um, be, before you purchase them. And if you're growing, and this takes me back to containers, if you are asking plants to grow and thrive and do their very best. And every plant seriously wants to do its best. Give it half a chance and it will absolutely turn itself inside out. Um, you have to make sure that you have enough root room in your pot. So this, this is a 14 inch pot. I could have brought a 12 inch pot and stuffed these six herbs into that but that cuts down on the root root so much for each individual plant and they will be in competition with each other that I just thought, no, I'm taking 14 and give them a little extra, extra root root. 
Um, if I wanted to, I could, in this 14 inch pot, simply put in three different plants and they would look small and, and sort of spindly to begin with and like, oh, wow, that pot's really too big. But that would allow the roots more space to really grow around and the roots propel the upper growth of the plant. So, um, so that that's, that's the other two things is watering. Um, the other for this particular handout, the, the key, the key, once you've established your container and you understand how much root room your plant needs, um, for just all right, just to go back to that for half a second. This one container would be suitable for one tomato. You put one small tomato plant in here, or one small pepper plant, or one small eggplant, just a baby, and you go, oh. <laughs> but by the end of the summer, you'll have a very healthy, happy plant and a very healthy, happy crop that you can fully enjoy because there's enough room for those big roots and, and peppers and eggplant and tomatoes have, particularly tomatoes, have big roots that they need to. Um, so but watering to keep your container well watered, <laughs> not allow it to dry out. And then the other thing, and down here, I don't know, um, I suspect that you have days of high winds. We certainly in Andover in the last few years have during the summer have suddenly gotten days where the wind is very strong and very hot. And wind is desiccating. Wind removes moisture from plants. So even if you've watered the day before, and that includes any gardens that you're maintaining. If you've watered the day before and suddenly there's a high wind that just blows and blows and it's a hot wind, you can expect at least 50% of that moisture to just vanish. It just, it, it, it just gets pulled out of the plant and the soil by the wind. And <laughs> so you have to be particularly careful with containers. Um, when the winds get high and start blowing. And I think with global warming and climate change that more and more we're going to see, see those winds and more and more we're going to understand why in so many parts of the world gardens are protected by walls. Um, some kind of high fence, you know, wall that, that, that breaks the wind and keeps it from desiccating plants. But those are the three big things a little regular feeding from time to time, and you can grow just about anything you want to. Uh, enough root room, adequate watering, and protection from the wind, or awareness of how damaging the wind can be. So before I start planting, because quite seriously, we could have this over and done within the next 10 minutes. <laughs> because once you've selected your plants, once once you've selected your plants, uh, once you have your so potting soil, once you have your container, it honestly doesn't take very long to put a container together. It's a very quick thing to do. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit about seeds and herbs in general before I, I begin the pot, because there are so many herb seeds that you do not need to purchase in plant form. You could purchase in seed form, just put in your garden when the soil temperature is right and, um, and stand back and say thank you six weeks later um, because they will just pop right up and you don't need to buy them um, as plants. And I've lined them up here not in alphabetical order, but in the order of soil temperature, because soil temperature is a very important factor in seed germination. And some seed will germinate very, very quickly and easily in cold soil. 
and actually prefers a cooler, colder soil. But some seed, um, you have to wait and be patient. <laughs> I swear, I was not born a patient person. <laughs> How I got into this business, I don't know, but sometimes I think it's the cosmic way of teaching me to be patient <laughs> because um, sometimes you have to wait until your soil temperature or your soil is just the right temperature. And I have a soil thermometer that I've had for a million years, but because for several years in Andover, we have a seed light that's part of our company and I've been the consultant for the last few years at Seed Library, and we do Zoom programs on gardening, and also we, we did before COVID have a lot of in-person gardening programs at the library. Um, and not everybody has a soil thermometer, and not everybody wants to purchase a soil thermometer, so I ran a series of tests with meat thermometers, various kinds of, I, I collect borrowed meat thermometers from everybody I could think of and tested the meat thermometers as soil thermometers against my soil thermometer, no difference. So if you have a meat thermometer, just plunge it in whatever bed you're interested in growing and, and check the soil temperature. The old way, the way that the farmer's almanac way, the um, practical, practical farming tips from long ago way is um, to, if you want to test your soil temperature to see if it's time to plant peas and, um, and things like that, why what I have read is you simply take your pants down and sit on the soil. <laughs> and, and if you, and, hang on just a sec. And if you sit on the soil and you're comfortable, then it's time for people. <laughs> but, uh, but it's you don't need that. If you have a if you have a meat thermometer, just use your meat thermometer. What? How far down? How many inches down should you put the thermometer? You for you, you, you put it all the way down into the soil so that it's resting. Thanks. That's a good point. Resting on the top of the soil so that you you push your soil thermometer or your meat thermometer down in the soil. For example, this is arugula. And, and um, arugula will germinate in probably about a 40 degree soil. I mean, it germinates very quickly in cool soil, at once cool soil. But basil, you get up here to basil, and basil wants a minimum of a 60 to 65 degree soil. And there's no point in trying to plant basil seed in cold soil because it will simply rot. Um, I've grown a lot of different varieties of basil. And if any of you like basil and you have had success with, um, with sweet basil and, and sowing it directly into the ground and you've had wonderful success with sweet basil, Try some of the other basils. I mean, there are over a hundred varieties of basil, and they all have a slightly different um, fragrance. They have a slightly different leaf. They have a slightly different flower. Um, this basil, which I have, this this sweet basil. This is the classic pesto basil. This is the basil that was introduced to Americans right to World War II. I mean, if you were Italian and lucky enough to be of Italian heritage, you already knew about this basil. But if you were, you know, an ordinary everyday American, it was like, huh? And you certainly didn't find it in your grocery store. Um, but this one you can sow directly as soon as the soil temperature, as soon as your soil is, as I say, a minimum of 60 degrees, but I would wait to 65. The warmer the soil, the faster this germinates. And when it germinates, it really pops up. In six to 10 days, you have baby basils, and then it grows very quickly as long as the weather is good and hot. Um, but this basil, this one, 
I've only grown from plants and purchasing plants, but I'm going to try it this year. I still think our growing season is too short for me to seed this um, directly into the soil. But if any of you see this particular basil um, in your favorite garden center, this is called cardinal basil. And this has this a really beautiful, plumy, dark red, crimson flower that um, works very nicely in flower arranging. This accent, it's as lovely as a cut flower. Um, it's also an excellent basil in cooking, making pestos and things like that. So this is, and this is a new basil. I was just researching it. I've never heard of this before. And apparently was an all American winner about four years ago called Persian basil. Um, and this, this one only gets about 15 inches high. This one gets a good three feet at least on, on a big bushy plant. I mean, very strong, sturdy um, central stem. But I'm interested in trying this one this year too to see. Yes. So the um, cardinal basil, would you use a 14 inch pot for that just one of those plants? All right. I, I can talk about putting it. Hang on. I heard the cardinal basil part of it, but. Oops. All right. Tell me again. Um, I'm going to cut it things about, oh, and I have to keep my eye on the clock, too. One of the things about basil, because I could talk about herbs for all day, we could send out for lunch. One of the things about basil is that um, there is a basal disease. There is a fungal disease very, very similar to the disease that killed off all the impatience uh, 10 or 15 years ago, maybe 15 years ago. I don't know if any of you remember that. But um, all of a sudden, your impatience began to melt. Well, the same thing happens to basil. It's a fungal disease that um, possibly came out of Africa uh, back in the early 2000s and um, has spread across the country. The only way that you can avoid that is not to plant your basils close to each other to make sure that they have full sun and excellent air circulation. Now, some basils, this isn't a basil lecture, but um, some, there are, two, there are two basic basil groups. Um, one is Mediterranean, originating in the Mediterranean. The other is a, a variety of basil originating in what used to be called the Far East, but Asia. And the Asian basils, and that would be the Thai basils, the, all of those, that variety of basil um, that comes from the Thai basil side of the family, they're resistant to the fungal disease. It's the Mediterranean ones. So your sweet basil, the cardinal basil, the Persian basil seems to be a cultivar of the sweet basil, but any kind of Thai basil, or if you come across a cinnamon basil, that one comes from Asia. Um, lemon basils seem to be resistant to the, to the fungal disease. So those you can plant a little closer together. Um, or you could have a bed of those and have a variety of basils. But these guys, you either have a row for the, for the sweet basil or the Genovese basil. You can plant that in a row, but just make sure there's good air circulation. Right? And if you're interested in companion planting, honest to Pete, basils and tomatoes, even though they only met about 300 years ago, 
basils and tomatoes really like each other. <laughs> they grow really, really well together. It doesn't mean that you're nestling the basil up next to the tomato because they both need enough you know, air circulation to prevent all kinds of diseases. But if they are in the same vicinity, they do assist each other in, in growing well. When you're starting um, with your seeds, how many seeds would you put into your 14-inch container? Um, if I was doing it in a container, yeah. I'm liberal. I just sprinkle them. And then you pick out the ones that Yeah, you yeah. Okay. yeah, thank you. I just, I just sprinkle them. There is one more basil I'll talk about that I'm going to talk about a little bit more about some of the other seeds. Um, and that is the columnar basil. If, if you're a basil lover and you have not experienced a columnar basil, um, that, that particular basil is, comes from the, the Asian side of the family and was discovered growing in a greenhouse in Connecticut probably 20 years or so ago. Um, it comes in a, in a green or in a variegation, a variegated, and it, it is by cutting only. You can't get seed for it, so you have to find a plant, and it grows up in a column, and it can get about this tall. I mean, it really, it's, it's lovely in a garden or in a, a, a collection of containers and it's a delicious leaf. It's an absolutely delicious leaf. And it just goes and goes and goes. I have been told that's the one basil that you can bring indoors and, and winter over. Um, but I tried it and failed totally. So, and I haven't tried it since then. So I can speak from personal experience that that worked um, because I, I don't have a greenhouse. I just have a drafty old kitchen <laughs> um, where the rosemary is happy all year long. I mean, all winter long, uh, but the basil just didn't, you know, by February, every leaf was gone. So I gave it a quiet goodbye. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, the, um, but you can begin very, very quickly by planting arugula and just sprinkling it. Any plant, this is a good rule of thumb, any plant that seeds itself, and arugula will seed itself, is a plant that does not want its seed covered. That you just sprinkle that seed on the top of the soil. You do not cover it. It needs light in order to germinate. So if you have plants that seed themselves, and you have a package of seed and you want to put it in a different place, just remember that you simply sprinkle on the top of the soil and then take the palm of your hand and pat. Just like this, the pat so that the seed has firm contact with the soil. And then if you're still nervous, if you like, I'm supposed to plant seed. And when you plant seed, you're supposed to put it in the ground, not on the ground. Just you can take just a wee bit and sprinkle it like that. It makes you feel better. <laughs> and the seed's still uncovered. So, um, chervil, if you haven't experienced chervil, you can seed this, and I plan to, the same time that you're seeding your arugula. Um, this is a very lovely spring um, self sowing herb that has a slight <laughs> anise flavor to it. It's sometimes called French parsley. Um, it looks very much like parsley. It will go to seed as soon as warm weather hits. But if you allow it to go to seed, you'll get another crop in the fall. And then it can perpetuate itself for several years before it, somebody comes along and eats it at the wrong time. <laughs> but it's a, it's a delicious, it's a delicious herb. Um, sorrel, do any of you grow sorrel at all for sorrel soup? This, this is a large leaf, very sour um, herb that is full of nutrients. It's very good for you. And it, um, it comes up early in the spring. And even though it's a big, tough plant, you can, it comes very easily from seed. And it's another one that, well, you know wood sorrel, right? Everybody knows wood sorrel. 
It's considered a weed, but you can also eat it. It's very sour, a small leaf that grows in the garden. Um, but this is a large cousin of that. And, uh, and sorrel soup, cream of sorrel soup is a classic spring um, soup. This is fennel. Now you have to pretend that there's dill here, all right? Both of these, their first cousins, this is bronze fennel. This is not the bulb fennel, but bronze fennel. And then the dill. Both of these, dill and fennel, they are first cousins. They are very closely related to each other. They are plants that have tap roots. And that means that if you purchase a plant of bronze fennel or dill or a flat of dill, that inevitably when you transplant that plant out of its flat or out of its container into the ground or into another, a larger container, you are disturbing the root. And no plant with a tap root once its root fooled around with, as in do not fool around with my root. I could fool around with every root here but I could never do it with a taprooted plant. So your best bet, if you love dill, is to seed your dill. And dill is, again, it, it's a plant that will seed itself prolifically if it's happy. So if you're seeding dill for the first time or you're seeding dill in a container, it's just sprinkled on top of the container and then patted in. And, um, and and you know, kept moist, but and the same with fennel. A fennel can become a hardy perennial, and down here, I'm sure it is a hardy perennial. It was a hardy perennial for me for 15 years before it suddenly decided that it had enough and died out. But it gets about this tall, and um, it has umbral. It's an umbral. It's got those lovely round flat flowers that the pollinators. If you are if you are interested in supporting pollinators, and I certainly hope you all are, and you're aware of the pollinator pathway that's being established up Cape, um, bronze fennel is an excellent perennial edition. Not only is it beautiful in the garden, it's delicious. The seeds are yummy. They taste like little um, licorice candies. Um, the, the flowers are lovely and can be used in, in um, salads and for garnishes. And, um, and the bees absolutely, and butterflies go nuts. And this is both dill and fennel are support plants for swallowtails, which is my favorite butterfly. <laughs> so, and you see monarchs up there too, but, um, but it's the swallowtail. If you're lucky, you get a swallowtail caterpillar. And it's eating it all up, but you don't care because it's like, okay, I want to see that butterfly. Um, so that that's, and then chives, which is going into the pot today. I just had to buy it because I'm dying for the chives to come up in the garden. You don't have to buy a pot of chives. Just sprinkle a little seed because, again, this is one that seeds itself. And do any of you grow chives already, please? Yes. And do you find it to be invasive and it makes you mad? No. Okay. All right. So the trick for that, and I didn't bring it with me, um, is to make chive vinegar. And so if, if you are lucky enough to have a child in your life or a group of them, or if you can borrow one, um, <laughs> you give them when your chives are in full bloom, nice full bloom, you give them that, the, that child um, a canning jar, a pint canning jar, or even a half pint canning jar. You say, stuff it. <coughs> Go cut off every single, just snap off every single flower and stuff it into the jar. Just and pack it in there and then bring it back up to the house. And then you hand them a bottle of vinegar and I use a white wine vinegar from Trader Joe's and just fill that jar with vinegar, screw the lid on, make sure you label it, 
and put it on the kitchen counter and watch what happens. The vinegar turns a lovely amethyst color. And at the end of two or three weeks, you can strain it and you have a lovely chai flavored vinegar and you don't have any seeds bouncing around the garden. Once the chives have produced their flowers and you have harvested them all, and you do this because it really is a delicious vinegar. Um, and vinegar lasts forever. I mean, 20 years later, you can enjoy that vinegar as long as you've strained it. Um, but the um, once you have harvested all the flowers, you just take a pair of scissors, grab those chives, and cut them right back to the ground, right to the ground. And if you are an organic gardener, and you believe in strict composting, return into the soil what you've taken from it. You lay those cut chives right around the base of your chive plant, let them die down and, and nourish the plant roots. And within two or three weeks, you have a fresh flush of chives, no more flowers, and you just have fresh chives all summer long until winter comes and they die back. So it's um, cilantro. And now I, will, I have to stop after, <laughs> but uh, cilantro, which is also coriander. And how many of you have, have allowed your cilantro to go to seed? Anybody? Yeah. You get this is a twofer. This is two herbs for one. And do you cook with a coriander seed? Oh, you should. I will now. No, oh, do you? Oh, it is the loveliest flavor. It really is. Yeah, and and uh, you know it's used extensively in Indian um, dishes, but. It doesn't matter. It's also used extensively in Swedish dishes. Um, and I'm not a baker, but the one cookie I used to make was coriander cookies. <laughs> because it's just a lovely flavor. It really is completely different from, from the leaf, completely different from cilantro. So if you can, harvest, harvest your seed. Anyway, again, the seeds itself, cool soil, doesn't like hot temperatures. So when this, you know, when the soil is workable, and you know how to tell workable soil, right? You put your hand in it, and if, if you have garden beds, I'm not talking containers, but you put your hand and you get the handful of soil and you squeeze it together. And then you open your the palm of your hand and you tap that ball. And if it crumbles apart, there's just enough moisture in that soil to begin planting. But if it stays together, it's still too wet and would be too cold for, for any seed to grow. So, um, but very quickly in your world, you'll be able to get coriander. And again, don't bury it, just sprinkle it. And so, okay, and one last quick little if any of you, do any of you grow, this is called Chinese chives or garlic chives? Anybody? Yeah. Do you do you cut the flowers? I just no. I let it go seed. It, it's in a container. Oh, is it? I, I cut the greens. But. Yeah, the greens are are. Just, it's a, this is a broadleaf chive. This native to Asia called Chinese chives or garlic chive, and it's it's delicious. Again, it comes up very quickly from seed. But if you if you have it in a garden bed, there are beautiful white flowers that come. And they're just lovely in, in late summer flower, mid to late summer flower arranging. And then when the seed, when the flowers go, there's a seed head. And I people are once again becoming interested in dried flowers. So it's a seed head that the, the flower is about the size of a quarter to a half dollar. That's and it's round and it has white flowers. But then, as each one of those individual flowers dies, there's a very round seed ball that forms. And if you pick that stem, when that just as that seed ball is, those little seed balls are forming, and you hang the stems upside down and dry them, that the, the little seed capsules 
will break open just enough so you can see the black seed inside and this kind of a golden interior. To, it, it's so pretty. And it, for those of you who are getting interested in dried flower arrangements, it's an excellent addition because they last for a long time. So any questions on seeds, anybody? <laughs> so, okay, well, now where's my time? Um, by the way, the second handout is just some tips on, um, on ways to use your herbs quickly, not fussy, not, not, um, not anything that takes a lot of time. Because for some reason, nobody wants a lot to spend a lot of time, but they want things that taste good. So, uh, all right, so let us get on to potting because our monomers are now growing in containers or considering growing in containers more and more and more. And this is supposed to be a good organic potting soil. Once upon a time, there was a potting soil created by a man by the name of Thacker. And um, it was the best possible potting soil you could ever lay your hands on. It's from the, um, it is no longer on the market. So in my estimation, this, this is a reasonable substitute for what I consider to be the best potting soil I'd ever, um, I had ever used. And I used it Years and years and years. But this is a good substitute for the soil. And this is called the Bar Harbor Blend. And it is an organic soil. But the coast of Maine is a good one. And you can trust any of their soils. The richest soil that they have, which I think is oh dear, called the Stonington Blend. Um, and that's also the most expensive. That was designed, I am told, um, for cannabis growing. So should you be growing <laughs> cannabis, that's the soil you want to go for. But, but this is good. <laughs> so it, it needs a particularly rich soil, apparently. And um, so it, the Stonington one is the one that cannabis grows. Um, but this one is pretty good. I often will amend um, potting soil with a few hands of handfuls of compost. They make a great compost too. I'm sorry, what? They make a great compost Yes, too. the lobster compost? Yes. Oh my yeah. God, yes. Really, the lobster compost? Yes, it's the lobster yeah. compost. And it is, <laughs> the first time I was introduced to that compost, the, the friend that introduced me, um, who you may have seen, did any of you, um, watch the um, Master Gardener series, the, the spring series that Master Gardeners did for the Cape. Um, there were three speakers. The first one was Karen Bussolini, and then um, the last one was John Forty, and I forget the, the middle one, but I, I, I watched them all. Anyway, it was Karen Bussolini, a good friend. Years ago, she said, you want to know a good compost I just found? I, said what she said, it's lobster compost. It's kick-ass. <laughs> it's a kick-ass compost. I went, oh, wow. and it is. But there is another good compost on the market, and that is black earth compost. And I think that black earth is starting to show up down here. Um, black earth is a company that does its own composting by picking up um, compost as in garbage, compost from um, individual homes. They have trucks you subscribe to their, they have trucks to go around and pick up. Um, they give you a bucket and you save all of your compostable. If you're not doing your own composting, you save all your compostable bits and pieces. And um, then <laughs> they pick them up, take them back to the North Shore, 
Um, I don't think they have any compost in sites down here. I'm not sure. Though. And um, take them back to the North Shore and in Manchester by the sea in Broad, they have two big compost sites. So it's very local compost. And that has a lot of fish and lobster in it too. Um, and it's a little bit less expensive than the lobster, than the coast of Maine lobster. By um, donating your compost, do you get a I'm sorry, but by donating your compost, do you get a discount on? Oh, you, you the get one product? free bag of compost a year. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> I guess it's better than nothing. <laughs> when you are filling a container, there is no longer, according to plant scientists, any need to put any kind of drainage material in the bottom of the container, um, which increases the amount of root root that a plant that the plant has. As long as there's an adequate number of holes, that any plastic container will have an adequate number of holes. Um, as long as there's an adequate number of holes in the bottom of the pot to allow drainage, why there's no need at all to put anything in it. And when you are filling your container, fill it almost to the top. The reason for that that once this pot has been thoroughly watered, once your container has been thoroughly watered, the soil will sink. And you, your goal is to end up with about an inch to an inch and a half of space between the surface of your soil and the top of your container. So that when you are watering, you can puddle water in. And, um, and not have it. So you fill almost to the, to the top. And then let me show you why I cut the bag this way. Can you all see? Oh, no, it was tough. It's tough. Is that you can make a nice, you cut your bag this way and not open it to the top. You can. Like this. And if you're lucky and strong, sometimes you can even make an odd and tie it. And that keeps your soil from drying out, the little bit of soil that's left. And, um, you know, and I'm not going to be able to make it. But, um, but you want me to get it moved on? <laughs> I'll get it moved. You think you can make an odd? Um, there, and make a good knot. Yep, she did it. Why not? Yeah. Okay. Do you remember? If you're as old as I am, you will have had done diapers this way. <laughs> <laughs> so, but that protects you. And it gives it an easy storage and it doesn't spill all over the place. It really works very nice. So, okay, now I've got six plants for this container. And I'm going to begin with the one that will probably be the largest one and the tallest one. And that is this sage. This is a forgotten sage. And the difference between a culinary sage, there's a there are many, many, many members of the salvia family. But the, the ones that we focus on for the kitchen, um, the two best, in my opinion, and it's only my opinion, so it doesn't, um, are a standard culinary sage, which would have a much narrower leaf than this, or the brigade. And I, I have 
come down heavily on the side of the Bhagat sage in the last few years, because this sage, um, not only is it incredibly hard, but it has this lovely rounded leaf that gets to be about that big. And this is the sage leaf that you can fry. This is the one you can drop into hot oil and quick take it out and put it on a paper towel and have it as a very crunchy, lovely little hors d'oeuvre if you sprinkle it with salt or put it on top of a pasta or rice. Um, it's, it's absolutely delicious. So I'm going to begin with that. And you've already seen the root, the root ball, but which is, this is, this is a perfect transplant root ball, but I'm still going to break up the root ball slightly with my thumbs because I want these roots to grow out into the container. I don't want them to continue growing in a circle. So, or in this case, square. So I'm going, this is the, this is the back of the pot. Right? So I'm going to put that right there. And when you are planting in a container, well, in the soil, wherever you're planting, always make sure, and I know you know this, but I'm gonna say it anyway, always make sure that you are planting that the surface of the top of your root ball is exactly the same level as it was growing in the, in the pot that you transplanted it from. That you do not want to bury that surface. It needs to stay at exactly the same level. Um, otherwise, your plant will begin to rot and get strained. So that sage is going there. Then I think the next is going to be this mint. And this is a peppermint, I mean, sorry, this is a spearmint and ready for harvesting already. And do any of you cook with mint? Do I drink with mint. Do you know that you're not, and I'm not talking mint tea or mint cookies or anything like that. I'm talking honest to God cooking. Mint, hot peppers, cilantro, garlic. Oh my gosh, they are bosom buddies. And any dish that you make that in includes garlic or hot peppers, um, any kind of a chili pepper, but throw some mint in at the end. Throw some sweet basil in at the end. But the, the mint really adds a lovely dimension. And if you happen to be fond of Asian cooking um, or Southeast Asian cooking, and you wonder how do they get that flavor? This is a secret ingredient and it is definitely worth having um, you know that, oh, all right, now here's a root ball because Mint is such a vigorous grower. How many of you have mint in your garden that you go, oh, I wish I never had? <laughs> um, all right, what kind of mint? Not sure. There's a lot of different mints yeah. out there. Spearmint. Well, spearmint. 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 But because it's so invasive, I partially bury the pot that I put it in. Yeah. So it does keep it fairly contained. Yeah. It's not as pretty to look at, but it keeps it contained. One of the ways to contain mint, um, this is an old organic gardening trick, is you cut it back in the spring, and then you take a spade, and you cut the plant into different pieces. You don't move it. You just cut it into different pieces. Just and if, if you are able to, or, or with a trowel, you know, just whack away and cut up that root ball into sections. Just leave it where it is. And the mint will not run. It stays right where it is because it has to develop new roots. And um, mints are heavy feeders. So they'll stay put if you can break up that root ball every once in a while and, um, and then give it a little 
compost around its base and it'll say, oh, okay, I'm fine. Because the reason it runs is that it's looking for fresh soil. And um, so that's, but anyway, I'm pulling this apart like this, and I'm going to plant this right next to the sage, right here, so that it's cascading over the edge of the pot. Now, if you do this, and you have mint cascading over the edge of the pot, Please remember that all mints, it doesn't matter what kind of mint it is, all mints will root the second the stem touches the ground. So um, mints can escape from pots very easily because every single, every single piece of this stem has the ability to develop roots. So all you need is this guy to go down here to the soil, and it's like sayonara, I'm off and running. Um, so, you know, keep it trimmed. The peppermint is a lovely mint. Uh, mints are wonderful in flower arranging, too, by the by. Um, big, bushy mints. I have a, a mint that I collected from a, um, an old cellar hole up in Maine millions of years ago. Um, it turned out to be Eau de Cologne mint was a great favorite in the late Victorian times. And it smells like perfume. It's not a culinary mint, but it's just lovely. And it's very bushy. And it, it just adds so much that peppermint to, to um, lots, summer flower arrangements, summer and fall flower arrangements. OK, so now we have sage. We have um, spearmint. Who's next here? I think. I will put the parsley over here. Now, parsley, she says, after she bought a big fat pot of it um, to use for you guys, comes very quickly from seed. If, <coughs> only if, after you have planted it, that you pour boiling water and ah, uh, look at that room wall. All right, this is where surgery comes in. Pulling off the bottom and breaking up the roots right here so that I don't want those roots growing in a circle. A parsley has, and carrots, if you grow carrots, they both have a, an iron clad seed coat, which allows them, oh, am I going too long, sorry, um, which allows them to, um, their seed to stay viable for years and years and years. Um, parsley and carrot seed can stay viable for a very long time because of the seed coat that they are enclosed in. And um, in order to break that seed coat, you need to um, pour boiling water on the seed. And it could hurt. It could feel like you're really torturing your seed, <laughs> but you will get a germination um, within a couple of weeks as opposed to a month. Um, can I ask you a couple of quest couple of questions while Please. you're planting? Absolutely. So we had we had two questions from our Zoom audience. One was, "Have you tried the black garden bags for tomato plants and other outdoor plants? I thought they may help with root rot." I have, and I have been singularly unsuccessful. And the reason is that um, they dry out very quickly bags too. Okay. You have to pay extra. Have any of you here had good experience with I've grow bags? Tomatoes in here. And it, they've been fine. They've done fine. Yeah. Well, that's because you were more vigilant with watering them. I, I have a sprinkler system. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, that's good. I <laughs> See, that's what you need. No, the, the one garden that I've been to, which is a rooftop garden in Quebec City, um, which 
was entirely done in grow bags, entirely done in gigantic, the medium-sized grow bags. But this, the watering system was very um, intricate and all over the place. And I know because I fell flat on my face tripping over <laughs> one of the hoses. Um, but it's, yeah. So, but it, you, you do have to be very careful. And then the, the, the second question was, can you repeat the name of your favorite sage? My, oh, Bergotten. Tell the, tell the camera. Oh. Tell the camera, that's your audience. Oh, Ber <laughs> Bergotten sage. Can you spell it? Here, you want me to? Where is it? Oh, there it is. Yes, you can spell it. It's spelled... Oh, it's, uh, is it German? It's B. No, it's Swedish. Swedish. Oh, okay. It's B-E-R-G-G-A-R-T-E-N. And it was found in the ruins of an abbey, maybe 50 years or so ago. All right. So now I have mar sweet marjoram over here, sage in the back, the smallest of all us, but it will be the greatest one. And then parsley in the middle. Parsley is a heavy feeder. It needs to, it, it, and it needs to be picked up on a regular basis. It's a biennial, so there's a potential it will come back. But if it comes back, it will come back as, um, as a plant ready to go to seed. So, um, and then the last but not least to go in is a very nice little lemon thyme right here in the front where it can cascade over the front. So you've got a cascade going down the back. You've got one right here going over the front. And you have a sweet marjoram to my left and the chives to my right. So you've got a pretty good pot here. This, all of these are very tough, Plants they can, with the possible exception of the sweet marjoram, um, they'll take down to you know 40 degrees, even 35 degrees in a sheltered area at, at night. Um, so the potential is that you can leave them out unless we get a really good cold snap. Now, once you're done with any kind of container planting, this is what you need to do. Give your pot a good whack, and that settles everybody down in all the root systems down into the container. And then, as time goes by, this is the fertilizer that I've used for years and recommend to everybody. And I do not have any kind of stock in this company, um, but it's called Neptune's Harvest. And it's a fish and, um, and seaweed emulsion that is, does smell fishy, but hey, we live on the Cape. <laughs> and, um, and it's excellent. It really is excellent for all kinds of plants. Um, the only downside would be indoor plants, which I once did years ago and never looked down the fact that Yes, just all smells like, <laughs> like dead fish. But now, watering this. If I was taking this home, the first thing I would do, it needs a good deep watering. And deep watering can only be done by immersing this pot in a container of water. So either a kitchen sink, if you're strong enough to get it up into the sink and out of the sink, um, or some kind of bucket outside your door where the water can come up as high as you can possibly get it. And sometimes recycling buckets, if they don't have holes in them, um, work just really nicely for watering containers. You want to leave a container like this in deep water until you can see water on the top of the you want it to leach up from the bottom all the way to the top. And what that does is it thoroughly saturates the pot. It gets the center of the pot nice and wet. 
the heart of the pot, and that's what you want. You want to keep this, the heart of that pot good and, and, and damp, and um, it settles all the roots in, gets rid of air bubbles and things like that. So that once the warm weather arrives, if you lift your pot and it's very lightweight, it means that it has dried out and you need to do that whole deep watering thing all over again. Unless you're lucky enough to have, <laughs> want to come see your system. <laughs> That's because, um, anyway, any questions? When we first started out, you had said that a 14 inch um, pot would take three plants. Are you doing six? Just I'm doing them? six, yeah. And for the idea, I, I said you, you could do three in here, mm -hmm. and really, but these six will get along well. Okay, yeah. yeah. And they, they, with any luck, um, you can, you know, if this, this thrives during the summer and the fall, it can come in for the winter because the mint's a hardy perennial, the sage is a hardy perennial. This, um, this marjoram over here, which is not my favorite marjoram, but it is a variety of marjoram, and you have to understand that marjoram and oregano are, you know, in the same family. So it's probably a sweet oregano, but it's 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 a very nice smelling plant, and it would be good in the kitchen. But that's a pretty hardy perennial. Lord knows you can't kill thyme, and um, and chives the same thing. The only one that would come out would be the parsley when it was completely done, but it can come in, in for the winter. It can be stored in a 35 degree or a 30 degree garage. Um, if it's well watered before it goes into storage and it can come back out. It can last for years is what I'm trying to say. As, as a portable pot, potted herb garden. Could you keep that inside instead of putting it out? It's, if you have windows and house temperatures that Lisa has, um, you probably could get away with keeping it inside because she's got some lovely sliders with just the perfect light coming in. And I mean, really, um, in, in our old farmhouse in Andover, um, I could keep it going slightly during the winter, but it would have a hard time. Because I've been growing Basil, all winter long. Oh, well, there you so go. So I thought, well, if I could grow well, that, that, in, that, in that case, yes. Yeah. I have a, I have another question here. Oops, shoot. Sorry. There we go. Do you leave your rosemary outside or plant outside and hope it lasts the next season? Do I? Yes. No, my rosemaries are in pots. But and you, but you're, um, you're also north of. Yes, I'm. I'm Boston. I'm on the North Shore, so my rosemaries are in pots and come in for the winter. But I leave them out until the middle of November. Rosemary can take down. The average rosemary can take down to about twenty-seven degrees at night. So, and is yours in the ground? Yeah, no, it's in a, a big. Both the size of a small box outside, it's all over. And the rosemary, the chives, and the sage all make it through everything. No kidding. I was I was oh, gonna say that's exciting. <laughs> I just planted um for the first time herb garden last fall on the Cape. I had one we moved down here recently, and my thyme, rosemary, parsley and sage are all still going and the tarragon's coming back up. So I was shocked. I would never have been able to do that. I live right outside of Boston. And I mean, I have stuff. Yes. I just went out and picked the sage last night. That's what I threw yeah. in the oh, yeah. Yeah. in the rice that we had. Yeah, our sage didn't even, I have a big forgotten sage. It's probably 15 years old outside the back door and it did not die back this winter. My herb garden is next to the house, but it's sheltered by the stairway and it's kind of, kind of sheltered. 
and my rosemary plant is two years old and it's about this oh, size. Oh, wow. I'm so excited. I've been thinking it all winter. I just, and the time finally did get it the last uh, month or so. Well, the sage too. I just cut them down and I Oh, no, just prayer. cut them back and they'll come back. They'll come back. They'll come more. But they're in the ground. They're not in yeah. pots. Yeah. Except for the things that travel, they're in the yeah. pots. So one one last question to all of you, Cape Cod Gardener. Um, have you grown or experienced lemon verbena? Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. Because, and can you keep that outdoors in the winter? Has anybody done that? just came back. Yours yeah. came back? I don't yeah. think. But you know, it was so invasive, I pulled the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> the lemon verbena? Yeah, because it's a subshrub. It's, it's, it's native to south. It's a shrub. <laughs> it's I'm the president. Of the and, <laughs> it's native. If it's lemon verbena, it's native to South America, oh, well, and yeah. and it's a subshrub. Um, it may even be a full shrub. It can. It can be, it can get quite tall and woody, but but it is tender. It's under the deck. I can pull up the coat. My little granddaughter loves to just pick it and eat it. Oh, yeah. It it. But check it out <laughs> online. <laughs> Google it and read about it because lemon verbena is just like, oh, it's deciduous. It's a deciduous herb. And, um, but, it, but it's a woody herb so that it will come back every year. It'll, it'll Drop its leaves, but but mine is in a big pot when it comes to eating it out. Okay. All right. Well, is there any other questions? Okay, well, thank you to all our people who attended by Zoom. Um, like I said in the chat, if you'd like to email me, my email's in the chat and I can send you out the handouts. Um, so thank you for coming.